The Square Ball Podcast. Hello, welcome to the show. It's brought to you in association with Levi Solicitors. 10% discount on your legal fees at levisolicitors.co.uk forward slash the square ball. Dan here with Michael and Rob, as we remember Ian Westlake and his goal versus Oldham. Who? It's the one we've all been waiting for. Yep. Oh, the letters are piling up. The email inbox is full. Do something about Ian Westlake. Do, something, do Ian Westlake mugs. Do Ian Westlake tribute issues. Is, is all that in the pipeline? Uh, probably just leave it at this podcast. Just this episode, just this, yeah. Just this one 15-minute episode. But well, there is a genuine possibility, joking aside, that you're not quite sure who we're talking about, depending on your, your vintage and how much you ex- enjoyed experiencing Leeds during the, the mid-2000s. These are your formative years, aren't they, Rob? Oh, they were the glory days, as I like <laughs> to call them. In fact, I am, um, weirdly, for some reason I've had a real craving to play Football Manager 2007 recently, mm. which I think it must might have been the first version of the game that uh, I played. But I downloaded a, like, a retro database for one of the newer games and I decided I uh, I didn't play it because it was not authentic enough for me because Ian Westlake was really good on it. Him and Kevin Nichols were like brilliant and I thought, no, I'm not having this. Well, he looked ace in the YouTube video that was made when we uh, when we signed him. He, he looks amazing in this. Yeah, why? Even even now I could watch this and go, oh, dear, it's worth a go. Absolutely worth a go. Just looks great on it. Smacking goals in from everywhere. Born to score. Is that a caption? Is it? It's what it says on it. Ian West, like born to score. Even says at the end, would make good signing for Leeds <laughs> with three exclamation marks. At there the we end. go then. Yeah, fair enough. The, graphic, still- the graphics on it are brilliantly um, 2007, aren't they? Some yeah, superb. Windows Movie Maker or something. But it's got a nice punk soundtrack to it. Which is uh, Red Flag by Billy Talent, which I've not heard. You'll have to go away and listen to that because we can't play it on this episode because we get flagged for copyright reasons but um yeah red flag billy talent uh you ha- you watch this and tell me you don't want him to sign i will do when we did um i did see one the other day as well it was flagged uh, a tyler roberts video before we signed him saying it's a tyler roberts the next ian rush wow fantastic which in terms of what he delivered for leeds <laughs> yeah <laughs> i guess i guess comparable better than ian rush <laughs> better than him yeah you could argue didn't play in his natural position didn't really score super yeah, yeah, yeah. and welsh so um that's good. Um, anyway, back to Westlake. You might not have heard of him, but he did play for England, didn't he? For the football team. Water polo. Water polo. Strong at his water sports, really into his water sports. Mm-hmm. Yep. Um, swimming was his big, big thought. I think we have mentioned on shows before where when we've referenced Westlake, that he was dead good at swimming. And he actually did beat a world and Commonwealth gold medalist in Karen Pickering some years back, who was, uh, I think, I think the official term is dead good swimmer. Dead good swimmer. Yeah, she'd won some gold medals and that. But she was an Ipswich fan. And I think it started off with him basically saying, I could beat her. And everyone went, don't be ridiculous. She's a a Commonwealth world champion swimmer. And he was like, no, over a certain distance, I reckon I could. He did acknowledge that had it been over more than 50 metres, he wouldn't have won. Yeah. But over 50 metres, brilliant. Yeah. Wiped the floor with her. And then was dead smug about it as well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> which is even better. He wasn't, he wasn't at all like um, magnanimous with it. He was just like, "Yeah, fucking told you, I'd win." <laughs> I think I'm owed a few apologies <laughs> from who, Ian? <laughs> <laughs> the bloody naysayers. Oh dear me. Anyway, he uh, was dead good at swimming. He featured on TV programs with his swimming. Was he better at swimming than football? Um, potentially. He, he was all right at Ipswich, wasn't he? Like, he scored a fair few goals. I do sort of remember at the time when we signed him, I was like, oh, he's that guy that I've like seen on the Football League highlights scoring goals. Mm. And I was sort of excited. But then back then, I was just excited when Leeds signed anyone. Yeah, he was, he'd got in England under-21s when he was at Ipswich. I don't know if he played, but he got called up, mm-hmm. which is pretty good. Swim, he, swimming or water polo or? No, no, football. The football, yeah. The, the, the kicking one. Um, Yeah, and he'd, Ipswich were a decent team at this point as well. They were generally around the playoffs I feel like mm-hmm. they were they were the team that were always in the playoffs and never got up mm-hmm. they were just always always kicking around there but he sort of made sense as a signing I'd heard of him and we were at a time when we were kind of we were, we were pre uh, relegation bankruptcy but we'd obviously come down from the Premier League and we failed to get back up in the playoffs in 2006 after the Watford debacle and then we got him that summer didn't we it was the, the signing to get us up yeah <laughs> He didn't turn out that way. Yeah, I mean, it was the summer we didn't have a great run with midfield as we signed David Livermore, sold David Livermore. Did a guide about that, actually. We've done a guide about that. There is a guide. Got yep. Kevin Nichols instead. Yep. 
got in um got in Ian Westlake. Yep. And uh yeah. <laughs> And well, that season unfolded. It, well, it, it had injury problems like the year before we signed Perfect. him. Best time to sign him. Yeah, <laughs> re- re- recovered <laughs> at his peak. Um, we he'd, actually he'd, heard... be, he'd been too expensive for years. Now he's fucked. Brilliant. Let's buy him. <laughs> but uh, he's spoken on it's Blue Monday, which I think is an Ipswich YouTube channel, and uh, he's talked about how the transfer came about on that. Yeah, they changed managers. So Jim Magilson has come in as manager. He needs a left back. He's interested in Dan Harding. And somehow, in a classic bit of Leeds United transfer manoeuvring, we end up giving them Dan Harding plus 400 grand. For Ian Westlake. For Ian Westlake. Right. Dan uh, Harding's all right for him. I completely forgotten about Dan Harding. He wasn't very good for Leeds either, was he? It, no. He, Dan Harding had pretty good hair, didn't he, as well? He was that sort, was he sort of that blonde, 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 like, blonde indie, floppy kind indie of... Indie boy sort of Yeah, haircut. the style everyone had in 2007. Yeah. Um, a fractured dressing room he came into at Leeds. That's, that's an interesting little insight that he... Uh, he gave us on the on Blue Monday. Mm, he's yeah, he's talking about um, Kevin Blackwell's dressing room that he's coming into, and he basically says it turned out none of the players liked the manager, <laughs> <laughs> and the players were just going to get the manager sacked one way or the other. It was quite toxic and just weird. Uh, some nice instructions from Richard Naylor though. Yeah, this is Richard Naylor who is not at this point signed for Leeds because we're about to get relegated and, and he will come in a couple of years later but a Leeds fan on the a left. Leeds fan yeah. knew him rang him up and told him to just smash someone <laughs> on his debut because people will like it <laughs> and he followed that advice and he said um, yeah he said that that's what he did and it, it, it did go down well but yeah um, Kevin Blackwell is someone who I've never heard anyone say a good word about who played for him because I've listened to quite a lot of interviews with people on like Under the Cosh and podcasts like that where they'll, they'll talk about the playing days Everyone, to a man, says they hated him. <laughs> it's interesting, isn't it? Because he was full of praise for Dennis Wise and Gus Poye. He um, was wrong on that, but... <laughs> and so, well, he said Poye was, was the best player at five aside, side um, which, given where we were and the players we had in the squad, is no surprise, really. But um, just back to the toxic um, dressing room, like, nobody was talking to Jermaine Beckford. Yeah, it just sounds like the senior pros who were there, which I guess are people like Paul Butler. I'm going to lay it all on Paul Sean Butler. Sean <laughs> yeah. Yeah, they were just horrible to people. By the sounds of it, trying to get the manager sacked, had their little cliques and wanted to continue with it. It's not a great mix, is it, when you've got a manager who's widely recognised as a bit of an arsehole and then all your players <laughs> acting like absolute arseholes as well. So, yeah, um, the minus 15 year was obviously one that sticks in the memory, 2007. Uh, that was a fun, wasn't it? <laughs> well, it was eventually, yeah. I mean, the... the to be fair, it was, it was fun from the get-go because we won five out of five. The relegation was... Not really Westlake's fault either because he was in and out of the team a bit and then from February he's injured again. So he, he's not actually there when it all unfolds and people go on the pitch again. Is it unfolds or collapses? Let's say, yeah, it, colla- <laughs> it definitely collapses. When people, the season ends with relegation against Ipswich, people on the pitch at Ellen Road, banging bottles, Westlake's not there for that. He, he's just like, I don't know if he was ever... Was asked, the Ipswich end? I don't know if he was ever asked about it, but yeah, he's, he doesn't have to be uh, be on the pitch as all, as all that stuff's going down. But yeah, Wise has obviously come in during that season, taken us down, which I personally don't think he gets enough grief for. He, no, I agree. Because yeah. he was there for ages. Well, the, well, well, this, the minus 15 turnaround has mitigated the actual failure of relegation, hasn't mm-hmm. it? But we, we were appalling in that um, in that run-in in the previous season before we got relegated, under Wise, but anyway. I mean, the way Westlake describes the completely toxic atmosphere and stuff, yeah. and we know at boardroom level it was all falling apart. and Completely toxic? I know, just the guy for it. Let's get Dennis Wise in. <laughs> but actually, there are really, really interesting parallels with our fairly recent relegation from the Premier League in terms of, like, you know, dressing room cliques and mm. it all not quite gelling and managers who people don't like and, you know. It's interesting about no one liking Wise. He says Wise actually gave a speech to the players and it involved saying, look, the fans don't like me. The Football League don't like us. The FA are against us, he said. And he, but he did manage to get that spirit going that within the players. Backs to the wall, kind of us against the world. Mm. Yeah. Um, and Westlake has actually spoken quite fondly about this time at Leeds, saying that uh, that run from August when the minus 15 kicked in and we obviously won a load of games to December was the best time that he had at Leeds. Yeah, I mean, I was... Sadly, not in the country for any of this good bit. I was there for the relegation, but um, yeah, we started just winning loads of games in League One. And although it was League One, it's fun, isn't it, winning games? Yeah. Particularly when you've lost, when you've spent a full season losing them. Yeah. Just getting the break from that is it's, a, it's exactly is the a princi- relief. principle we've spoken about with relegation from the Premier League. The idea of winning a few games and having something to get behind again is much more fun than mm-hmm. just grinding along year after year, isn't it? 
Yeah, West Westlake, Westlake still wasn't established in the team. He was in, and then I was trying to work out from the lineups what had happened. It looks like Clapham comes in, and there's a reshuffle into between left backs and left midfielders, and but he's he's getting a bit of time off the bench. So to Oldham then, and they run into that. Obviously, we like I said, we'd, we'd won five out of five to eradicate the fifteen. We actually won the first seven, didn't we? As it and we then Dennis Wise was correct about the corrupt bastards because we should have beaten Gillingham. But we had two men sent off and they scored in the last minute. And what happened as a consequence of the two sendings off? We don't have Beckford or Candle. We don't have Beckford or Candle. I assume uh, Leon Constantine was injured. Yeah, it was. I think he was injured and I think, sorry, Andre Flo was oh, also injured because he was knocking around still. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously mates with Dennis Wise, I think. So, yeah, all, all the strikers were out, which meant, well, what do we have to do? We had to borrow some. Imagine that. Emergency loans. Do you remember the emergency loan market? That was fun, wasn't it? We were in there most weeks, weren't we? The, yeah. the emergency loan market. It was quite exciting that you could just turn up at Ellen Road and not realise that two players who like you hadn't realised we'd signed them were just in the mm. team, albeit. I don't think people were that excited about Mark DeVries and Wayne Andrews. No. And when it was Max Gradle and Sam Vokes, I think that mm. was one one of the games where they both just some play, new players had turned up. But yeah, Andrews and DeVries. Hmm. There is actually on the blog, there's a guide to DeVries and Andrews because they've got this weird random status among Leeds fans of like, if you were there and saw him play, or in DeVries's case, if you were there and saw him score, that is, uh, you've really earned your stripes there. Yeah. It's like, it's like I don't know, spotting a, a comet or something, isn't it? <laughs> once, once every 80 years, Ali's Comet. Um, yeah, so we signed Wayne Andrews, Mike DeVries on emergency loans. We headed to Oldham um, and... Oldham, I mean, we mentioned on, on one of the shows that we recorded recently that West Brom is actually the highest ground in England in terms of like altitude, but it doesn't hold the same memories for me as Oldham, which I remember going to as a kid. And Oldham is in the foothills of the Pennines. It's cold. It's bleak. It always felt like it rained. Mm. We had a bad record there in the 90s as yeah, well, Yeah, and we? they had such a hex on us. It was a mi- generally a miserable, miserable experience going to Oldham. And obviously this game is in October, so we're, you know summer's in the rearview mirror. It's a midweek night, Tuesday, 7.45 kickoff. I went to this game, and in my mind it was misty and cold. I don't know how accurate that is now. With the passing of time, I genuinely cannot remember, because it's, what, 16 years now nearly since this this happened. I can remember the good bit that's coming, but I can't remember much about the actual the, the night itself other than it felt very typically Oldham. Yeah, it's, it's hard to tell in the highlights what the weather was like because they're so sort of murky and it, the quality isn't great. But uh, on, there's like a five-minute highlight compilation on YouTube and I think like the first minute of that is just basically teams taking throw-ins, yeah. which doesn't suggest it was a great quality game. There is a moment as well, about a minute in, where... Wayne Andrews goes through one on one. You think, oh, here he goes, debut goal maybe, and he skies it very, very, very high. Well, we'll talk about the actual game in a second. Let's just set the scene first because there's a real Leeds link to this Oldham team. Um, there are bodies in there that we recognise. A couple of big lads, spine of the team, all Leeds. You're talking Sean Gregan, <laughs> Neil Kilkenny in the midfield, who at this point is just on loan from Birmingham, and then Michael Ricketts. Front. Ricketts was one of those players who he played against us a lot of times and I feel like every time he played against us there was a bit he went oh he's going to come back to bite us here I don't think he ever did <laughs> I think he was just always so completely terrible he um, he, ne- he never did we've done a Ricketts guide as well haven't we mm. to the uh, football and not the disease yeah, yes <laughs> yeah um, and Oldham managed by John Sheridan at this point as well his first stint there and uh, he just o- always ma- he's managing Oldham or Chesterfield all the time isn't he John yeah Sheridan. if you have to guess who's managing Oldham just say John Sheridan yeah, you're probably, probably going to be right and this will tears up for something we'll come back to later on about what happened next with John Sheridan but yes that is very very true um, and a teenage Ryan Bertrand there as well on loan from Chelsea alongside yeah. uh, a very old Mark Crossley it kind of blew my mind that these two had ever played in a team together I just think of them as being completely different eras but yeah Crossley's 38 at this point and Bertrand I guess is about 18 but there they are together playing in League One Is that Chris Taylor in Oldham's midfield was it him that we were always linked with like constantly Oh that does ring a bell actually yeah. he... and this um, this game is strange almost in the sense that and you were talking about the amount of throw-ins that we had nothing happened in this game <laughs> genuinely that's how I remember this my mind's eye sees sees the, the sort of the, the mist and the murk on a cold, boring Tuesday evening in Oldham, and nothing happened in this game until <laughs> quite late on. 
But you, you've been at these games before where you, you're just like, I'm just so bored. The Birmingham game was like that mm. recently, wasn't it? This season, I would say. It was a game where you'd go and you say, what's happened in this game? You'd be like, like nothing. I don't know. Was there a shot from the edge of the box that went over? Uh, yeah, there's one bit where we make a defensive mess up and it looks like we maybe have given away a penalty. That was the main other highlight I took from it, where there's just some general chaos on and, the edge of the box. And at this time, you're talking about two teams that are in the sort of lower mid-table reaches of League One. Now, um, we sh- we were top of it, morally. That's yes. That's where we were. But we, we were, we were they were down sort of about 14th, 15th, something like that. We were in the same sort of ballpark as a result of the... Uh, the points deduction. So it was it was a game lacking in quality, I would say. And and it was quite obvious from watching it. I remember being there thinking, it's obvious these players letting like DeVries and Andrews don't play for us and have never played for us and have probably trained <laughs> once in the tactics, being up front. Um it's weird, isn't it, to think forward several years to be also wanting people to train for weeks and months with the team before I'll put them in. This was just basically a couple of big lads have arrived <laughs> on Friday. Yes, yeah, stay fine, stick them in. Because, yeah, it's one of those nights where you kind of, you, you're reviewing your life choices, you know, when you're in that away end thinking, why why do I do this? Why have I come here? <laughs> Spent my time driving up over the Pennines to come to Oldham to watch this miserable nil-nil. And then it gets to the 95th, 96th minute. And what is effectively the last kick of the game, apart from them kicking off afterwards, I think. Yeah, the highlights are delightful for that because the, the goal goes in and then it just shows it all going back to the centre circle. They kick off straight away, the ref blows. It's like, oh, perfect. perfect. Just... <laughs> Even Leeds can't mess this up. <laughs> but they mean it's a nicely taken goal. Yeah. It can go on. Des- describe it. They should really tag this on the end of his Born to Score compilation video. I was going to say it was this kind of goal that we were expecting him to score more regularly. Yeah, arriving late into the box. Seb Carroll's got it on the in the left. Looks like he's probably a bit crowded out for the cross, but he manages to dig it out with his left into just into space in the box and then emerging from the mist, probably. Yeah. Oh, there's someone getting on the end of it. But I, no, I remember because... I was dead central in that away end, just up towards the back at Oldham. And it's not a very deep stand. It's relatively shallow. So you're not that far away from it. But I had a great view of it. But I was right in line with the goal because he just comes in and absolutely paggers it into the net um, in a straight line arrow in my um, my field division. And it was it was magic. It was, And one of those moments where you're reminded why football is brilliant because it can be awful for 95 minutes. And then that happens and you get a moment where you know, like in the blink of an eye, you've gone from a, why have I bothered to, this is amazing, <laughs> we've won. And that's what football's, football's all about, yeah? It's a great, it's a great fuck off twatting it in goal. Yeah. Must be said. There's a lot, you can in, appreciate goals in lots of different ways, like a scrappy one that just goes over the line can equally be fun for a last minute winner. But this is just no doubt into it. It's just a, fully takes the back of the net off. Yeah, superb. Just what a moment. And, and in a way, end that, yeah, it goes from kind of, oh, well, at least this is nearly over to. Just, at least they won't have to watch Wayne Andrews yeah. too much more. <laughs> to pandemonium. Absolutely fantastic. And he'd, he'd only just sort of come on the field, hadn't he, at, um, yeah. at Westlake? He was a very late sub. I believe um, Dennis Wise had just been shown the video, Born to Score video, and it was like, it's like get this guy on. <laughs> I didn't know he played for us. He's on our bench. <laughs> yeah, just a fraction over 10,000 hardy souls brave that um, autumnal Oldham on, on Tuesday night. And to best, I think, encapsulate what this night was like, I dug out the BBC match report. It's 78 words. <laughs> 78 word match report. It's like, oh yeah, not what happened. Westlake scored. League one though, isn't it? Yeah. They're probably similar these days, but yeah. There were some throw-ins. Penny and Westlake scored. <laughs> well, Oldham finished eighth uh, this season. A couple of points behind Brighton. Have you heard of those guys? Going nowhere, those chumps. Yeah, uh, but although they were they were miles off the playoffs in the end, they got sixty seven points, which is the same same total as Brighton. Um, but they were nine points behind Southend, who were in sixth place. Then Leeds, we finished fifth that season. Um, had we not been deducted the fifteen points, we would have gone up behind Swansea automatically, a point behind them. And had Ken Bates appealed the fifteen point um, deduction, as the EFL expected them to, by the way, and I know that because I spoke to the guy who ran the EFL at the time because I was involved with the trust. Um, they expected him to appeal and they would have reduced it to 10 points on appeal. Um, we would have gone up in second place behind Swansea, still on 86 points. Um, and as it was, we actually ended up with that far more grim experience than a Tuesday night in Oldham, which was that defeat to, to Doncaster in uh, in May at Wembley. That was sad, wasn't it? Happy times. 
That was sad, wasn't it, boys and girls? <laughs> um, Sheridan stayed at Oldham, actually. He was there the following season. And then um, the following March, there were reports of him fighting with some of his players at a racetrack, which seems very on brand for John Sheridan, <laughs> who, if you don't know who John Sheridan is, basically a brilliant 80s footballer who... He, he, was, a, he was a Rolls-Royce of a footballer, but booze. <laughs> He was, a, he was basically a lush, wasn't he? Like, he'd go out drinking and then turn up for training on the match the day after. Like, he'd go out on a Friday night and play on a Saturday, that kind of thing. Yeah, Wilco didn't much care for it, did he? No. Um, so, bombed him out. But, yeah, he, uh, he was brilliantly talented. Um, yeah, so he managed the next game after this this supposed fight at a racetrack, but then he left the club. And there, as we were touching on before, he actually returned to be Oldham's manager three more times. The most <laughs> recent now, it seems. No, I think the most recent spell ended in September 2022. Oh, okay, maybe, he's, maybe his wiki's not been updated. Yeah. <laughs> oh, no, it's his last head coach, sorry, yeah. Yeah. It's, he's, his managerial record is bizarre, though. It goes, it goes Oldham, Oldham, Oldham <laughs> at the start of it, which is weird, because he's done the co-caretaker, caretaker, and then, uh, yeah, Chesterfield a couple of times, and just lots and lots of Oldham. Doesn't travel much. No. As for Westy or Westlake, this was probably his high point, I would suggest, in a lead shirt, do you think? I mean, it was mainly relegation of 50, minus 15, so yeah. Yeah. And then um, by the time Gary Mack comes in, don't really fancy him. Can you name the future Leeds manager that he worked under in his post Leeds career? In Westlake? Yeah. <sighs> Dave, Dave Hockaday? It blew my mind when I read this. So he. Left Leeds the season after he was on loan at Cheltenham and he joined them permanently. He went on to play for Oldham, a lot of Oldham, this uh, show. But then he joined Wickham, Montreal Impact and Needham Market. Right. I don't even know where Needham Market is. Somewhere, Somewhere near Ipswich. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he, he makes it very clear he, he's a, he lives in Ipswich. But on that interview, so I, I assume Needham Market was near there. Um, which which club is it at? Is it in, it's not Needham, is it? Who managed Montreal Impact? Come Jesse. On. Yes. No way. Jesse. So he, Westlake joined Montreal Impact in 2011. They became an MLS club in 2012. Jesse Mash signed him to play in the MLS and then fucked him off before the season started. They like waived his contract and he sent him packing after bigging him up. Oh. But yeah. It blew my mind reading that Jesse Marsh and Ian Westlake. When worlds collide, eh? That's crazy, isn't it? That is cra- that's more, more insane than Mark Crossley and Ryan Bertrand playing on the same team. But yeah. Wow. So Jesse the villain? Yeah, definitely. He he couldn't get the best out of Ian Westlake. But Gary Mack was probably right to get rid of him at Leeds. Yeah, and he said, going back to the Blue Monday show that he was on, he'd struggled with injuries after he left Leeds and he just couldn't get back up to the same level. And in the end, he decided to retire and he now works in property. He runs a, a letting company and manages, uh, well, project manages new builds in Ipswich, of all places. And presumably all the um, the new builds have got swimming pools. <laughs> Almost certainly. Right, we'll see you soon. The Square Ball Podcast.